Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and I would like to welcome you here to the very first lecture on drag design and discovery. Um, now, I really do hope that you will enjoy these lectures, um, so let's get right into it. So, drag design, if we look at the basic definition of drag design, now I know there are numerous other definitions um, on the internet, or if you just Google it, you will find numerous different definitions of drag design and discovery. However, a basic definition now specifically for this course would be that drug design is the science that deals with the discovery or design of new therapeutic agents and the development into useful medicine. And it usually involves the synthesis, structure activity relationships, and receptor enzyme protein interactions, and any absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. Now, let's just um, stop here and go through these different parts of drug design and discovery and what is meant by each part. So synthesis is basically organic chemistry. We use organic building blocks to develop new model, um, molecules. Now, that is one way in which you can design and develop new therapeutic agents, new organic molecules, is through synthesis. But that's not the only part in drug design where we can identify new therapeutic agents. Just think about natural products, um, also marine um, natural products, and you can even get some therapeutic agents sometimes from animals. So there are numerous various like, different parts or different areas where you can get therapeutic agents from. So synthesis is your main area and that we've seen um, in drug design and discovery and at uh, big pharmaceutical companies. It is mainly through synthesis where you get to your new therapeutic agents. Now structure activity relationships is basically where you have your new molecule that you've synthesized or that you've identified and you can do certain structural modifications on specific groups in that molecule and see what is the effect of this modification and the effect that it will have on activity. So that's where the name comes from. What is the effect of the structure or the effect that the structure will have on the activity of your molecule and what happens when you change certain functional groups in that molecule and combine that is known as structure activity relationships. Drug design also deals with receptor, enzyme and protein interactions. Now a collective name for receptor, enzyme and protein interactions is known as pharmacodynamics or the pharmacodynamic effect of this molecule. And this is basically the way that the molecule will interact with your receptor, with your enzyme and with proteins um, in the body. And then also, drug design deals with the pharmacokinetics of a molecule. And that is, includes the way that the drug gets absorbed in the body, the way that it gets distributed in the body, metabolism, and also how it gets excreted from the body. So all of this basically makes up drug design and discovery. So drug design and discovery today is a multidisciplinary approach or multidisciplinary process. So you can see here that there will be numerous experts that will be working together to develop new medicine. It is basically impossible to work on your own to develop new medicine. So if we just look at this here, we will see that you will have to have experts in pharmacokinetics, somebody who has expertise in biochemistry. You'll have your pharmacist who needs to know about different dosage forms. What about clinical development? So once you have your molecule and you want to get into clinical trials, you need somebody with expertise in clinical development or in clinical trials. You need to have somebody with uh, expertise in computational chemistry. And as we go through this course, you will see how important computational chemistry actually is in drug design and discovery. So you can see here, it's people from numerous different fields that come together um, and they can provide expertise from all of these different disciplines in an attempt to develop new drugs. So, so far it might look a little bit easy to develop a new drug, but it is in fact not. So the average time that it brings to, to bring a drug to the market is about 12 to 15 years. Now this might seem to you as a very long time, but as we go through this whole process, you will see that you need all of these, to get these years to get through the whole process to make sure that you have, uh, you have um, safe, effective and high quality medicine that you bring into the market. So the average cost currently 
for a drug to get it um, from where you start with your drug design or drug discovery up to a stage where it then gets marketed with the average cost is about one billion dollars. Now this is actually a little bit more. I think um, there's, uh, there's also some literature that suggests that it can even go up to two billion dollars. So you can see it is a very, very expensive exercise to do, try and develop new drugs. One of the reasons that it is so expensive is that because you have to synthesize or develop about 20,000 compounds and of those 20,000 compounds that you've made in a laboratory and you evaluate it in animals only 10 of them make it into human clinical trials of which one goes onto the market. So you have to have money and um, research grants to develop these 20,000 compounds. So you have to pay for each and every one of those. You have to pay for the 10 compounds that makes it into clinical trials. And only one of those compounds makes it onto the market. So this one compound has to then pay for all of this research that, that was ongoing in the pharmaceutical company that wanted to market this one drug. So you can just see through this process already, it's becoming quite expensive because all of this has to be paid for. So next time that somebody comes to you in a pharmacy and they ask you why is medicine so expensive, then you can tell them that um, this that we've basically discussed just now. So what are the basic steps in drug design and discovery? So the very first step that you have to take is you have to choose a disease that you want to work on or a, a, a disease that you want to you, that where you want to develop new molecules or a new therapeutic agent. Now you can't just select any disease. It needs to be a, a disease for which there is an unmet medical need. So what I mean by a disease with an unmet medical need, if we look at um, diseases and disorders such as malaria, tuberculosis, HIV, um, even, even dengue fever, there are numerous of these different diseases for which we don't have effective medicine yet. So you have to choose then basically a disease for which there is an unmet medical need. We can think about malaria, for instance. We have good medicine for malaria, but unfortunately, the malaria parasite has become resistant to all of these different medicines that are currently on the market. So the research is ongoing to develop new medicine that can reverse the resistance associated with the malaria parasite and hopefully get to medicine that are more effective compared to current drugs that are on the market and for which there is resistance against. So you have to choose a disease for which there is an unmet medical need. You also have to choose a drug target. So even before you start with your research, when you've identified your disease, you have to identify a drug target within this disease. Now let's say for instance we look at neurodegenerative disorders. Neurodegenerative disorders are disorders like Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, Mashida joseph disease and stroke. You can go and read up on each and every one of these um, on the internet. So in, for instance, Parkinson's disease, they, you have to identify a drug target that you can target to stop the progression of this Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease being a neurodegenerative disorder, so a progressive neurodegenerative disorder. So you need to identify a target that can stop this neurodegenerative process. So a way that you can do that is by identifying the target that can stop the neurodegenerative process um, and you can work on this target and if you can develop a molecule that can work in on that target, stop that uh, or inhibit a specific protein or an enzyme, it might then slow down or completely stop the neurodegenerative process. So you have to choose a disease, have to choose the correct target that you want to work in on and then identify a bioassay. So a bioassay is a test used to determine biological activity. So you have to first, once you've identified your target, make sure that there is a way that you can actually test whether or not your molecule can inhibit or antagonize or work in on this, this specific target that you've identified. And you do this by developing a bioassay. If it's impossible to develop a bioassay, you can't work on that drug target. And further research needs to be, go, needs to be done to identify a bioassay for that specific drug target. So that's a very important part. You don't want to start with your development of your new molecule and when you get to a phase where you can actually test it to see if your molecule is working, then it's impossible to do it. 
Next, what you need to do is you need to find a lead compound or you need to find a molecule that has some activity to this specific target that you've identified. So a lead compound, if we look at the definition, is a structure that has some activity against the chosen target but not yet good enough to be a drug itself. So we'll talk a little bit more about lead compounds as we go along in these um, lecture slides. So from the lead compound, you can then synthesize analogs of the lead compound, and you will synthesize analogs maybe to improve the activity of the molecule, maybe decrease some of the side effects associated with the molecule, or maybe there might be some um, pharmacokinetic problems. Uh, maybe the drug is not soluble enough, so you have to then synthesize a molecule or a derivative thereof that is maybe a little bit more water-soluble so that it can get absorbed from the gastrointestinal tract. So you can synthesize analogs based on the lead compound that you've identified. And then furthermore, then you can identify structure activity relationships. So you have your lead compound, you made different derivatives of the lead compound. Then you can say, okay, if I change this functional group, it increases activity. If I change another functional group, it might improve the solubility. And if I take away a certain functional group, it may lead to some side effects associated with, with this lead compound. So that's the basic steps in drug design and discovery and I know that I've said quite a bit on this slide now. You don't have to worry about it. We will go through each and every one of these steps in depth as we go through the, the, the different lectures. So for new drug candidates, they must have the following. So you can have a look at some of these, um, some of these points here. For instance, a new drug candidate or a new medicine that you want to develop, it has to address an unmet medical need. Now, I'm not going to go through each and every one of these. Uh, for instance, uh, also, it has to be effective and safe. So you don't want something that's effective, but it's not safe. Then also, it won't go through clinical trials. It has to be able to be prepared on large scale. So what we do in a laboratory, we basically use a, a gram scales where if you go into pharma industry and you get to a point where you can go into clinical trials, this drug needs to be synthesized on large scale as well. So you have to be sure that it's possible so that the synthesis route that you're actually using is not so difficult that it's not possible to get it onto large scale. It also has to be patent protected. So this is very important. When you develop a new medicine or a new molecule, you have to make sure that it's so diff it's com it's different compared to other molecules that are currently on the market or medicine that's already been um, registered, it needs to be different so that you can get the patent rights for that molecule. Because if you don't get this, then you might run into some problems later on um, and you might not get the money uh, from this specific um, drug that you've developed um, that uh, back that, that, that you've used so far. And then there are numerous other reasons why um, you have to have a new drug candidate and a different um, uh, points that needs to be considered. So if we look at the whole drug design and discovery process, now this is from where you identify a disease for which there is an unmet medical need up to a stage where you get to the end of a large clinical trial and you get your drug onto the market or you send it away to your medicine regulatory authority, you will evaluate your application and then give you the go ahead to market the specific drug. So if we go through this whole process, You'll see, first of all, you'll have to identify a disease for which there's an unmet medical need. You'll have to do your target discovery. So you'll have to identify a new target for a specific disease that can either stop the disease from progressing, cure the disease, or maybe um, alleviate some of the signs and symptoms associated with the disease. Target discovery is also, uh, also important part of it is validation, and that's basically to make sure that you will be able to test the molecule whether or not it's active against this target or not. Then, from that, you will get your assay development and your HIT finding. So, you, after you've done your validation of your, of your target and you've developed the target, you can do the assay development, make sure that you can test it for, and you can find lead compounds that could potentially work in on this specific target. Then your lead optimization. So once you've identified your lead compound, you can go into lead optimization, which will basically be the way in which you will design derivatives or synthesize derivatives of your lead compound. 
once you're happy with your with the series of lead compounds that you've synthesized you can go into the candidate selection so in this you basically just select which is candidate selection point you just select those candidates that you think might make it through clinical trials so only your best candidates candidates uh, lead compound candidates that showed good activity a low low safety or high a good safety profile um, and um, good pharmacokinetics good pharmacodynamics so it's only those compounds that you think has the potential to make it through clinical trials then the next part is to do non-clinical studies non-clinical studies is basically your in vitro studies on animal models so you use mice you can use rats you can use higher primates, like for instance baboons or monkeys. Um, so you do all of these studies on animals to make sure that the drug is safe before you get into uh, your actual clinical trials. So once you've gone through all of the animal studies, the non-clinical trials and animal studies, you can go into any early clinical safety and efficacy. So this is basically where you get into human clinical trials. And you might have heard of phase 1, phase 2 and phase 3 clinical trials um, that part makes part of the large clinical trials to show us how safe the molecule is or how safe the drug is also how effective the drug is in humans and then finally you get to when you're done with your large clinical trials where you can then submit it to a medicine regulatory authority for review and hopefully if everything goes well then you can get the drug um, onto the market so you can see this whole process like I said takes about 15 years. Now you can just think about this, if you have to do a large clinical trial you need about 100 healthy or um, 1000 volunteers or 100 healthy volunteers you have to get all of those people together. It might take two years for them to be on this therapy. You can think about also all of this part of the uh, year with target discovery and assay development. That's something that can take a few years as well. And then something that's not included here is that even your medicine reg registration, when you submit it to something like the Medicines Control Council of South Africa, can also take about two to three years before it gets into the market. So you can see that this whole process is quite a tedious and time-consuming process, and that takes about 12 to 15 years to get through this whole process. And I've had students previously ask me, is it really necessary to take so long? Can't they speed up the process? Unfortunately, it's getting more and more difficult to register new medicine. And the reason for it is that um, there's so many quality aspects built into the development of medicine that in each and every one of these steps, you have to make sure that it's of high quality, that it's effective, that it's safe, that there's no impurities, that there's no problem with maybe the formulation. Um, so it's getting so difficult with all of the guidelines and regulations that we have to make sure that the drug is safe and that what we get onto the market is the best that we could possibly get. Um, that because of that reason, it, it, it takes quite long to get the drug onto, onto the market. And obviously, if you look at all of these different phases of drug design and discovery, um, you can see that also the financial aspect of it, money, uh, will, will it becomes quite expensive to try and develop all of um, or get through all of these different processes. And that's also one of the reasons why it is so expensive to develop new medicine. So if we look at drug discovery, so drug, drugs are generally not discovered directly. First, a lead compound is uh, identified. So we, I've already shown you in the previous few slides what a lead compound is. So a lead compound is a prototype having the desired activity on your specific target that you've identified for your disease for which there's an unmet medical need, but also other the undesirable characteristics like, for example, toxicity, other activities. It might be insoluble. It might have some metabolism problems or oral bioavailability. Um, it might have poor, poor oral bioavailability. So your lead compound is a compound that's not optimal for, for the activity or for the desired target that, you, that you've identified. And you can use this lead compound then to do lead synthesis. And you can basically do, do lead synthesis or lead modification to amplify the desired activity. So you want to increase the activity, make it more active. 
and also to minimize or eliminate undesirable properties, some of those properties that are shown over here. So this could produce a drug candidate. So on this previous slide, I showed you a drug candidate. That's candidate selection point. So it could then produce a drug candidate, a, comp a compound of worthy of extensive biological, pharmacological, and animal testing. So if you look at it again, um, so candidate, hopefully you have this candidate that can go into non-clinical trials, and non-clinical trials is where you get into the extensive biological, pharmacological, and animal testing, and hopefully if everything goes well in the non-clinical trials, then you can move into human clinical trials. So this is just a, 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 just a um, picture of showing you how difficult it actually is to develop new medicine. So you can see, yes, the poor old scientist, and this scientist has to go through this entire football team to get to its proof of cancer concept or its candidate selection point. So you see this scientist, he has to get through drug metabolism and pharmacokinetics. It has to be absorbed from the gastrointestinal tract. Maybe it shouldn't have any um, cardiovascular effect. Um, it should be uh, not lipophilic or um, it's, it's, it's again absorption and its distribution. Um, it's IC50 value, so it has to be active, structure to its relationships. So it has to go through all of these different football players or parameters before you can get to a drug candidate. And um, you will agree with me that this isn't the easy thing to do. Um, this guy needs to be very lucky. Hopefully he's very fast and he can run um, around all of these football players. So we spoke a lot about lead compounds now, but there's sometimes in drug discovery when you get lucky as well, where you discover new lead compounds or actually new drugs serendipitously by chance. So one drug that was discovered by chance was penicillin. So in 1982, uh, 1928, Alexander Fleming noticed that the green malt has the has the ability to analyze a culture of Staphylococcus aureus. So what he then basically did, he this mold spool contaminated the culture dish. He left this dish on the bench top while on vacation. So he went on vacation whilst um, this green mold formed. And the weather was unseasonably cold. So this particular strain of mold was a good penicillin producer. Um, so then when he got back to the laboratory, then he found that, oh, wow, I have this green mold spore. Let's isolate it. And what he basically then isolated was penicillin. So this guy was actually lazy. He went on to on vacation. He came back, and that was by observation that he saw that there was something weird and wonderful happening. He identified them that green mold spore as, pen as penicillin. And he could not get penicillin in a useful clinical form. Um, so that was that was one of the major drawbacks because um, penicillin has quite a bit of stability problems. But then later on, in 1940, this guy then succeeded in producing penicillin in a useful clinical form. So in this case, with penicillin, penicillin was discovered without a lead compound and was pure luck. So sometimes in science, in medicinal chemistry, in drug design and discovery, luck also plays a very important part. Um, and in this case, you can see that um, in this case, it was this guy just was extremely lucky. Then there's another serendipitous discovery of Librium that was also without the lead compound. So you can have a look here at what this guy did. Um, he basically left some of his compounds that he synthesized a few years back um, in a refrigerator. When he did the assay, he couldn't find any compounds that were active. And then in a last attempt, five years later, he Later, he um, tested these compounds again against a specific assay, against a specific um, a target. And what he then found was the compound Liberium was then identified as a side product which is formed from the original synthesized compound. So during storage, degradation happened. This was actually a degradation product that formed. So then this guy identified Liberium, which is a sedative or a tranquilizing agent um, that is to, that that actually led to quite a number of benzodiazepine drugs synthesized from that so you can see in drug design and discovery and in these two cases that serendipity or lack also played quite a big role in the development of new 
compounds. So then this, um, in the New Yorker magazine, they actually had this picture in, and this was in, as you can see here, in 1957, where they actually say that th this is one way to discover drugs, is just by going into a laboratory and throwing everything together and hope you get lucky. But unfortunately, this isn't the way that we do drug design and discovery. What we do with drug design and discovery is using something known as a rational approach, where you get to know everything about a, a specific disease, you know the different targets, you know which compounds could work on it, and you go through a rational approach um, in your design process. I can promise you if most of you go into the laboratory now and you try and just throw all of the chemicals together, you will most probably cause an explosion and not develop a new drug. So let's talk about sources of lead compounds. So most drugs I have are not discovered but are designed from a lead compound. And this we've seen from the previous few slides. So for example, the Hazapam was designed from Librium to possess tenfold higher tranquilizing activity. So our lead compound came from this serendipitous discovery of Librium. They used this lead compound and they developed through organic synthesis. Now remember, organic synthesis is one of the main parts of drug design and discovery. And from those derivatives, they then developed um, numerous different active agents, and the one that worked best is diazepam, and we all know it as Valium, which is used for anxiety and insomnia. So it, it, it's um, actually a, a benzodiazepine, and it gets routinely used for anxiety and insomnia, and it also gets used for mu muscle spasms, um, but unfortunately... Um, this drug also has some drawbacks where you can get dependent on it actually quite quickly so that they just prescribe it to you for short periods of time. So there are four so five sources of lead compounds known as random screening, non-random screening, drug metabolism studies, clinical observations and rational approaches. Now this brings me to the end of this first part of these um, online lectures. In the next part you will then see um, I will talk about the, the five sources of lead compounds and how you can identify lead compounds using these different sources. Thank you.